I love hot spots. Not, not the kind that John referred to during the prayer time. Okay, I, I pray that those would go away. Uh, in fact, uh, the church is connected with, if not, I don't know that we support, I, I know that the, um, the Slavic Christian ministries came one time and spoke about what was going on in the Ukraine and stuff. Uh, so that's always on my mind and that's still going on, unfortunately. Um, and so I just keep praying for them. So I don't love those hot spots, but uh, in general, when I say the term hot spot, what comes to mind for you? Wi-Fi, phone, internet, the interwebs, uh, depending on what movies you've seen. Um, so yeah, and we generally, right, love hotspots. We love connectivity. We love the internet. Life evolves around the internet. Uh, these days, right, we need our Wi-Fi. Uh, if you don't have Wi-Fi, start twitching a little bit, you know. Uh, I can't work. Almost I can't live anymore. Uh, and if our phones don't have service, so why, there's no Wi-Fi and you don't have data, well then, like, you may as well just not be living anymore, right? Like, just go to bed, wake up when the problem is fixed, whatever's going on. Um, this world certainly recognizes uh, that internet, Wi-Fi, hotspots, those are all a part of our lives. Uh, you all are familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, all right? Seen that? The hierarchy of needs. So the idea, uh, the hierarchy of needs, it's a motivational theory. Uh, actually, let me move this and drop my water. Um, ah, better than the mic, right? Um, so this is, it's a motivational theory in psychology that basically refers to the idea that we have foundational needs, larger needs, more present needs, that once those are fulfilled, then we can move on to like the next level of our needs, which maybe aren't as important. I mean, they're important, but they're not as crucial or vital. And once we, uh, so you can see there the physiological needs, once we have bananas and water and house and fire, not the house on fire, but we have heat and warmth, uh, then we can move into worrying about our safety. Are we going to be safe? Uh, does anyone have a concealed carry that's going to shoot me right now? Uh, am I driving in my car and I cut someone off? Are they going to, you know, do something crazy to me? Um, as opposed to me, I just yell and get frustrated, but I don't generally do anything crazy to anybody outside of the car. My family's a little traumatized, but... Uh, and then you have love and belonging. Uh, once you feel like you're a part of a family or a relationship, you, you've received that, you feel that, then you can move on to working on your self-esteem and then ultimately self-actualization, knowing who you really are. It kind of rings true, right? Like, there's certain things about it like, yeah, that makes sense. I can't really focus on these things if I don't have food or enough to eat. But in terms of uh, what the world recognizes as our needs and maybe what we do, let's go ahead and see some of the modified version of this. <clears throat> so uh, now in our day and age, there's a greater than physiological need and that is Wi-Fi. And maybe even before that, uh, the next step would be battery power. Uh, so once you have battery power and Wi-Fi, then you can move on to those other things. Um, and it feels that way at times, all right? Just take a phone away from an, a teenager and watch what they do. Um, I substitute teach and uh, it's really fun. You wanna see the most like deceit in one concentrated period of time. Tell the students, go ahead and put your phones in the pockets on the wall uh, and then they will uh, sit there in their desk. And I'm like, I know you have phones. I know you do. Go put them away. Oh, I, I don't have a phone. Mine's broken. Or what, and, it, and then, you know, five minutes later, they're in their backpack putting their AirPods in or whatever and fixing that. So um, it rings true, but it doesn't quite, it's not quite truth. Because I don't know about you, but I've been in situations where there's people who don't have food or don't have shelter. And for some reason, their sense of love and belonging is just amazing. You know, there's people that don't have certain things within the period, but they know who they are and they're living out their life's purpose without the needs beforehand. And so while this is somewhat of a helpful chart, I don't think it's quite accurate. And, and kind of the scripture that comes to mind for me uh, when I look at this, I think of Jesus in the wilderness, being tempted in the wilderness. You know, he's, he's hungry. Scripture says he's hungry. The amount of time that he's there, I, I, I think more famished or starving, you know, because I go a few hours 
past the time when my body knows it's time to eat something, uh, and, and I am like, I'm getting crazy, you know, or my mind is just thinking about food, 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 food. What am I going to eat? What am I going to stick in my mouth? And then another scripture comes up, and it's like, you know, uh, their, their stomachs are their gods. I get convicted by that one all the time, uh, and I'm like, all right, fine, Lord. I'll try and pay attention to you and not think about what I want to eat. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, I'm not Peter, uh, you guys know that, right? Uh, I'm shorter. Uh, I'm less in shape than he is. And your brains will get a little bit of a rest this morning in one sense, philosophically. But uh, my brain also does bunny trails and things like that. So you might have to follow the rabbit a little more. Uh, so I'll exercise a different part of your brain this morning. Um, but the, so going back to the scripture that I'm reminded of when it comes to this is uh, he's in the wilderness, he's hungry, and, this, and then Satan tempts him to make, turn stones into bread. Well, make yourself some food. You could do that. That's easy enough for you. And Jesus responds with, well, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. And so there's something in there where, well, maybe physiological isn't our greatest need. Maybe our greatest need involves more love and belonging. Or the top portion, you know, words from my father, words from my creator, well, that speaks, one, to a relationship, and two, those are words that are going to define who I am. And if that's, like, and it's bread alone, just to clarify. I'm not saying everyone should stop eating, uh, so you can still continue to listen to me, uh, because you're like, that's it. He told me to stop eating. I'm out of here. Um, you can still eat. It's bread alone. Like, we need the words. The words are, are what's important. And so, anyways, uh, it was at this point that my brain started going, like, a million different directions, uh, because I was trying to pretend to be Peter or John or uh, Brett, and I was preparing a sermon, uh, which is not really what I do. I like to kind of just have a discussion and teach, and, and small groups and one-on-one -on -one are more my thing. Uh, let's walk together. Let's take life as it comes. Uh, but in preparing for today, I was like, all right, sweet. We go this way. I had, I think, like 50-plus scripture references that I was going to put up, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of different scenarios and things and uh, examples, and then I realized, oh, I'm, I'm really preparing a sermon series on the kingdom of God, uh, kingdom of heaven. And so Peter just, he may as well take a break for a few months uh, while I finish this out. And then I realized, wait, what was I invited here to do? And initially, Peter had said, hey, would you mind sharing a little bit about what you do with C.S. Lewis and the Inklings? with the Oxford. And so that was, that was the intent. And I was like, I really need to get back to that. Uh, but it's the thing, like with my brain, I'm like, okay. And then we're, I'm traveling with someone in Oxford. We're talking about C.S. Lewis. And then all these things come up. And I just want to have a discussion with each of you. Um, it's not very, it's not ideal for this scenario. So even though I may ask questions and I may act like I'm having a discussion, I've already kind of thought out some answers, so you don't have to worry too much about uh, having to respond. I'll let you know, though, there's like one moment where I'll stop and I'll wait, and we'll just stare at each other awkwardly if you don't say anything. Um, so, but I'll, I'll let you know that. So, uh, quite a few people consider me uh, an expert on C.S. Lewis, and let me clarify that a little bit. In one sense, it's it can be true. So if you define expert as X plus one, whereas an X is what you know, and I have the plus one, then yes, sure. Uh, I could be an expert in some cases about C.S. Lewis and the Inklings. Uh, from what I know of people in this room, though, you all probably know C.S. Lewis's writings better than I do. All right? I've read through almost all of them, but I haven't retained all of that. You know, Peter will start talking about C.S. Lewis stuff during staff meeting, and he'll, he'll say some things. He'll be like, Anthony, you, you know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember that reference. But I'll Google it real quick because I love hotspots and I love the internet. Um, and I will find it for you, and I'll make sure that we're on the same page. Um, really, what fascinates me and what I would claim expertise on is Oxford itself, the place, and the relationships and the people that were living in it. So C.S. Lewis's life, the people he was connected with, the group, the Inklings, and their community and relational, like that more interests me. The place and the people is really more what interests me and what I've spent most of my time doing. So if you're okay with it, 
And if you're not okay, I guess you can just leave. Um, but if you're okay with it, I'd love to take you on a very, very short journey through Oxford. Is that okay? All right. Um, and here's the deal. I'm, I'm not trying to promote myself, although I do have a running deal uh, with people. If you pay my expenses uh, to go to Oxford with you, I will be your like, amazing tour guide. And uh, I have multiple people who vouch for me in this, and I, I am talking about experts this time, like the top five to ten leading experts in C.S. Lewis, and they, like, they know absolutely everything. Uh, I've led them around Oxford, and they loved it. I've got testimonials. So, uh, you know, that, again, like I said, Oxford and how it relates to the people, I will claim. Um, again, not self-promoting. I'm just, you can trust me on this. And what we're going to do is in, like an infinitesimally small portion of even if you just want to get together, I've got some 360 videos and 360 photos for more of an immersive experience. If you just want to hang out and, and look, like talk and chat and have discussions based around this, let's hook up some time and do that as well. Uh, totally, totally into that. Um, so, well, we got to get to Oxford first, right? All right. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to head to Wheaton, Illinois, all right? in our brains, in our minds. Like I said, I'll, I'll, I won't exercise all of uh, what you normally have to do when Peter's talking, but let's do our imaginations a little bit. Um, so we're going to go to Wheaton, Illinois, and they have what's called the Marion E. Wade Center. Man, my cheeks are really chubby in that. So, all right, cool. Uh, God bless COVID. I think this was shortly after restrictions had, had gone. Um, so we're in Wheaton, Illinois, Marion Wade Center, and it's devoted, this Wade Center is devoted to uh, the literature, the works of uh, seven um, English writers, British, I should say UK writers, because uh, C.S. Lewis is originally from Ireland, uh, and Northern Ireland, so UK writers, we can go with that. Um, it's devoted to them, including him, Tolkien, uh, George MacDonald. Uh, so fun names, fun people to read. Uh, inside here, though, at the Marion Wade Center, there's something a little more fun, and it's a wardrobe, okay? And it's a wardrobe that the Marion Wade Center would like to argue is the inspiration for the wardrobe in the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, here's the deal. If you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, you know what the wardrobe, the wardrobe is described as an ordinary wardrobe with a looking glass. This wardrobe doesn't quite look that ordinary and it has no looking glass. Now, there's a school in California that also has a wardrobe that uh, used to be in the kilns, the C.S. Lewis house, uh, that does have a looking glass, is not as ornate as this, and they argue that theirs is the one. You know what? It could just be that in the UK, there's wardrobes all over the place, uh, and it was just an element in the story. But the fun thing about this one is that this was made by Lewis's grandfather, all hand-carved. Uh, it was created by him. Even the hardware, okay? It's one thing to carve wood, but then uh, don't mind the screws on the right. Those are replacements. Uh, but the ones on the left, the nails that are put in there, those were hand-done. The hardware was hand-done uh, by his grandfather. Like the creativity and stuff that goes into that, there is something magical about it. So whether it was the one actually in Chronicles of Narnia or not, uh, well, I'm sure we'll never know for sure until we get to talk to him but it is beautiful. Uh, but I think it's time for us to go to Oxford, right? So we should enter into the wardrobe. How does that sound? You guys ready to go in? Let's do this. Ooh, look at that. Look where it led us. You guys notice a couple elements in there? Who's there? Tumnus. Mr. Tumnus is there and his evil twin brother in the shadows there. You didn't know that. Mr. Tumnus has a, a twin brother just past him. There's also a lamppost. All right, so it looks like we're in the right place. We are in Oxford. I didn't know Narnia was in Oxford, uh, but, you know, there we go. Where we're at, actually, is uh, you can see also in the back there is uh, the Radcliffe camera, named after uh, Dr. John Radcliffe, but it's actually a part of the library system there, and it's a beautiful room uh, to go in and read in. Uh, I had the privilege of doing it once, and I definitely did not take any picture inside because uh, that is against policy. I'm not going to show it to you because I don't have it. I s oh, I'm not swearing. Um, okay, uh, but where this is, is right next to University Church of St. Mary the Virgin. And this church, uh, the original church was established in 1086. Think about that. The original church 
has been around for over a thousand years, and it was in the center of the old Anglo-Saxon walled city that was Oxford, originally like wood, wood walls and stuff, and then upgraded to stone uh, about a hundred years later. And the oldest part of this church building is the tower, okay? And you can see the spire that's on top there. Uh, and the spire is considered to be probably the most ornate and beautiful spire in all of Oxford. And if you're familiar at all with a poet named Matthew Arnold, there's a quote that is just, uh, it's always, like whenever any group that I usually hear going into Oxford the first time, uh, the quote about uh, Oxford and uh, her city with her dreaming spires, uh, that she needs not June for beauty's heightening. So she's just so, Oxford is so beautiful with her spires uh, that there's no need for the seasons to bring in the beauty of the flowers and everything because she's got it. Um, there's something here about creativity and beauty that when you're in this, especially in person, like it is awe-inspiring to think of, this is stone, stone that was actually pulled from where C.S. Lewis's house, his village and stuff was. Most of the stone that has been pulled from there, it's called Headington Quarry uh, or the quarry for local folks. Um, Hand-carved, heavy stuff that's just built and put together uh, so laboriously to think about the time spent to do this. And, and it was done because, well, God is awesome and beautiful and amazing. And so we're going to do something that reflects his glory. We're going to try to get as close as we can to it. Um, and so the creativity that he's inspiring here, the, the architecture and, and the person who created this is inspiring, should hopefully point us back to God. It should create a hot spot in which we, we start to feel God's presence in some way. Um, but I think we can talk about more of this. Uh, let's go inside the building. And again, you end up with, you've got the beautiful pipe organs, you've got the wooden pews, you've got the contrast of that, the wood to the stone. Uh, you go and, and you're sitting there and you're looking at someone who's teaching in that type of beautiful, what would we call that? Pulpit? Lectern? pulpit uh, with the stained glass behind them, and you can't help but be inspired. And, and what it makes me think of is, is creation. And there's a story that we live out right now that started with God and us together. It started with creation. God's kingdom, man's kingdom were once united together. God created us to be co-creators with him. He created a world with us and for us to, I mean, there was waste and wild. There was chaos and disorder. God organized it, ordered it, brought in uh, creation, put us on it and said, all right, you do it, okay? You work it, you rule over it. And there was a certain level in which it was perfect, but we could still do something to make it better in a sense. Like the world was going to produce fruit, like the garden was going to produce fruit on its own, but we were supposed to tend it. And so if we prune it and take care of it and we garden it, then it'll produce more. And so there's a certain extent of like, that's how it was supposed to be. Our kingdoms united together. And then we said, well, God, we don't really like your kingdom or your presence so much. So why don't you go ahead and take a break and we've got it. It would be better with a little more death, a little more violence, uh, a little more destruction. That seems better to us. Uh, and, and so God said, okay. And he kicked, we kicked him out in one sense. He kicked us out. And our kingdoms were divided. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of man. All right. Except God didn't quite go away completely, did he? Like, there's always some aspect of him around. And that's where you end up getting into uh, certain passages that, again, come to mind when I think of that. I think of Jacob's ladder. You all familiar with that, Jacob's ladder? Okay. Now, uh, really, my understanding is it's not really a ladder. It's more like a staircase. So, Maybe more like even a spiral because that's kind of the ramps and staircases they did. Almost like that one there to the lectern. And this is, this is why I like 
going to certain hot spots like Oxford uh, and visiting different places because you see things and hopefully they trigger for you different instances of uh, truth and, and where God is present. And so I see that and I kind of think of, well, Jacob's ladder. And Jacob, uh, uh, Jacob is talking, <clears throat> pardon me, I don't want to cough directly into the mic. Uh, in Genesis 28, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed that night because, why? Because he was tired <laughs> and the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder or a staircase set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There's no conditions there, by the way. Keep that in mind. There's no conditions. Like, they will be blessed through them. And behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven." Jacob is expressing a place where God's kingdom and man's kingdom were overlapping in a hardcore way. It was a hot spot for unity between the two kingdoms again. Which, if you, I mean, you read the Bible, you see that is the entire plan, is that God created our kingdoms together. We fought against it. He's like, eh, I'm still around. And basically just bringing our kingdoms all back together again, ultimately in reconciliation and unity. It almost reminds me uh, of a verse that is pretty important that we talk about, uh, or at least if you go to the website, uh, we talk about all the time, and that's uh, in Colossians. And for some reason, here we go. Colossians 1, 19 through 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. To the point where we don't need hot spots anymore. We are just one giant hot spot. <laughs> where the Son of Man is the Son and the light, all we need. And we don't need little hot spots anymore. And one of the ways that we get to those hot spots is by hearing from the Lord. And much truth was spoken here. In fact, Lewis preached here a couple times. Uh, the weight of glory. Anyone familiar with that? Yeah. So the weight of glory, he preached here June 8th, 1941. He was standing up there. I got to hear Malcolm Geit speak from there once. That was a beautiful thing. Uh, if you get the chance, if you, if you like poetry, even if you don't like poetry, check out Malcolm Geit sometime. Uh, He's pretty good, and if you can hear him speak his poems, he usually has audio recordings with them. It's amazing. But one of the things that I really love in The Weight of Glory, which Lewis spoke here, is that there are no ordinary people. And I think one of the times, one of the things that we like in the kingdom of man is that we like to think that we're the ideal human. <laughs> uh, we forget about Jesus as the ideal human. Uh, we think of ourselves as the ideal human and other people can just take a hike. But Lewis reminds us that there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, um, and exploit immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. And if we're honest with ourselves, usually we're the ones who are the horrors. That was me, not Lewis. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. If he is your Christian neighbor, he is holy in almost the same way. For in him, also Christ, uh, sorry, this is Latin. Let's see if I can butcher it well for you. Christ vere latitat, the glorifier and the glorified, glory himself is truly hidden. 
Think about hearing the words that were spoken there, sitting in the room in front of that, in that beauty, like just the ability to transcend the kingdom of man for a moment and be in a hot spot where you experience the kingdom of God. If we climb up the spire in this tower, we end up getting to see this. So that beautiful spire that you saw, we're looking at outside now at the uh, Radcliffe camera. And again, just a moment to take in. I, it's, it's just, I don't know about you, like do you have a place where you can go and there's just beauty and you connect easier with God? One other place for me is on the top of a mountain with a snowboard strapped to my feet uh, and ideal conditions. And, you know, you just sit there for like 30 seconds, a minute, and you're just like, wow, this is awesome. And then you stare at the ground and hope you don't hit something sketchy that makes you uh, eat it. Um, which if it's nice powder, then it's not too bad. But uh, anyways, Places like this as well, they take me. Well, let's head back to Mr. Tumnus. We need to continue on. Uh, again, I don't want to keep you here too long because uh, I, could, I could talk all the time. Just ask my family. Um, so I think if we look at this from a different angle, oh, yep, Mr. Tumnus and his brother are guarding a door. Uh, there appears to be something engraved on the door. Can anybody make it out? Here, let's, a little closer. Anybody see that? Where, any thoughts? A lion, that is what every tour guide in Oxford will tell you. This is the place that inspired C.S. Lewis, the lion, the lamppost, Tumnus, they're all right here. Uh, but I'm going to pull it a little bit closer. Um, looks more like a monkey to me than a lion. Uh, but legitimately what it is, you ever heard of the green man? So green man is an architectural motif. Um, it's, it's common uh, enough that people know it as it. And it's basically just a symbol of nature, a symbol of rebirth and life. You can see the vines uh, and the foliage or whatever coming out of him. Uh, so it's the green man. But, you know, for, for fun and, and, and giggles, let's go ahead and uh, pretend it's Aslan leading us to our next stop. So let's go through the door, shall we? And we end up at another post, not a lamppost but a post nonetheless. <clears throat> and uh, this post is holding up, I don't know if you can tell, a giant, what may as well just be another tree. This tree is beautiful. I uh, once tried to have uh, our small group of 11 guys surround the tree and we were barely able to do it touching hands like this. Okay, it's huge. Uh, the tree is 235, uh, 200. 23, 223 years old, uh, planted in 1801 uh, from a tree that came from uh, the garden in Maudlin College in 1666. So it's an offshoot of that tree, but that is a big tree. Just in case you want to see how big it is, uh, that's a truck, a pickup truck that's parked under it to the left. All right. I wonder where Tolkien maybe got his inspiration for the Ents. You know? <clears throat> so this tree is actually in front of uh, the new building that is hundreds of years old. The, the new building in uh, Maudlin College. Maudlin. You guys ever heard that word? So Magdalen College, if you see it written, but this is the only place where Magdalen in Oxford is pronounced Maudlin. Uh, and you'd have to take that back to a speech thing uh, about, I think, 100, 150 years um, where they dropped their G's. They didn't have G's and stuff. So uh, apparently we are not the only country with fun accents, depending on where you're at. Uh, but this is where Lewis was a fellow, a professor in our terms, uh, for about 30 years. And and being a, a fellow or professor in Oxford really meant it was almost like a monastic life. You were married to education. You were married to your job, what you were doing. Uh, and so he actually had his offices, which is where he could also live here. And so he stayed here every now and then. But he, under the radar of Oxford, had his house in Headington, uh, known as the Kilns. Uh, that's for another time, another story. But it was here that the Inklings had their official group. So we, we just talked about the hot spots for beauty and the hot spots for location. Uh, but here is where I think a hot spot for relationship happened. 
a hot spot for community, uh, especially. Not that it's not beautiful, but when you think of the Inklings, the Inklings were a group of 19 men. Sorry, ladies. I, officially, ladies could not be a part of the group. Now, I do make the argument, and I got uh, this bookstore in, uh, it's a rare bookstore. They started carrying Dorothy L. Sayers books in the Inkling section because I had a talk with the guy, and I, I mean, I don't know it was me, but I know it was me. Um, she now appeared later that year. I went back and saw that her stuff was in there when it previously wasn't because I had said to him, they had a lot of interactions together and they influenced each other as people and as writers. Um, and so I, I just consider her a part of the Inklings. Um, but officially, no. Only dudes uh, could be a part of the Inklings. 19 men, Charles Williams, Owen Barfield, uh, Christopher Tolkien, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's son, J.R.R. Tolkien himself, uh, uh, Neville Coghill, uh, playwright and poet, a uh, lot of people, 19 of them. And but only about six to eight at a time would get together and meet. And officially, they would meet in, this, the, in his rooms here in new uh, building, and they would, talk, they would go pour out their new writings, what they were working on, uh, what the things you know of, the Chronicles, the Space Trilogy, Narnia, all them, uh, Lord of the Rings, Hobbit. They went before this group to get into actual publishing and stuff. So uh, they're bringing their hearts and their souls and their writing. They were all Christians at the time when they had the a group officially going, but Lewis was not always a Christian when he was in these rooms. Um, and the purpose of the group was not to necessarily propagate Christianity. Um, it was just to be themselves, to be writers, to be people who were invested in the world around them, in each other, and to encourage one another uh, in a harsh way by our terms, because uh, they said some fun things to each other. Uh, fun being mean and what I would consider difficult and harsh. But uh, if, if any of you seen the, the movie, The Most Reluctant Convert, uh, or if you've heard the monologue um, by Max McLean, uh, it was in one of these rooms that Lewis had a significant conversation with uh, two of his friends. So Tolkien and Dyson. Dyson I love. He was less about the writing and more about the hanging out and talking, which that's me. Um, I would rather sit in a room and have a good uh, bit of something to eat and something to drink. And I would rather just make jokes, listen to people talk, talk, things like that. Uh, so Hugo Dyson, Hugo Dyson is more of my guy. Uh, but it was in these rooms that that these guys gathered and had a fairly significant conversation after taking a walk uh, over in Addison's Walk. So we're crossing the bridge right now. This is the what I call the herd bridge um, because the Madeline College has a 300-year-old uh, herd of deer that they own that's on the grounds. Um, in fact, uh, I think if we continue to cross over, uh, we might be able to see them. Oh, look, there they are. And again, a giant tree not as big as the other one. It, it's almost like trees are significant in this life. Yeah? In fact, I think every Sunday we talk about trees here. Some sort of tree of life, tree of knowledge, Jesus on a tree. Um, anyways, it's stuff like that. The random things that come up, uh, that's what I really love about journeying with people and hanging out with them is, you know, you'd be walking, you see something, it's like, oh, look. That's, uh, by the way, those are two white stags. Um, which is really cool. They were just chilling there. For all this time, I thought, you know, uh, white hearts in, in Scottish vernacular, uh, in English as well, white stags, that they're very rare, which they might be. I saw the only two on earth, apparently, um, or the only two I've ever seen. Um, so it was on Addison's Walk that Lewis had a fairly significant conversation. This is before he acknowledged uh, Jesus uh, was real, or at least in the sense of that he was who he said he was. Uh, you can't really argue that Jesus was real or not. There's, I mean, if you believe in Abraham Lincoln, if you believe in a lot of people who you've never seen before, but you take uh, historical accounts to be accurate, then, then Jesus was real. But was he really who he said he was? And uh, so let me read you a little excerpt of Dyson and Tolkien and uh, Lewis taking a walk. And by the way, just in case, again, I love the trivia. I love the mundane. I love the little things here and there. Uh, it's it kind of what, what makes things fun. Uh, Lewis, a lot of times, if you look at his pictures, he's 
described by his, uh, his oh, I'm not going to out anybody, but he's described by his friends as a roly-poly, jolly Irishman, okay? So, and if you've seen pictures of him, he's kind of disheveled, like he, you think, he's not Anthony Hopkins, let's put it that way. If you've seen Shadowlands, Anthony Hopkins is not what C.S. Lewis looked like. Uh, he was a professor who liked to smoke a lot. Uh, you're talking like 12 packs of cigarettes a day and a pipe and other things. Like he, he had ash on him. He had a button mist here and there. Like that was more who he was. And he was a bigger Irishman, but he walked all the time. And you think of someone like that walking and it's kind of like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm on Addison's walk. Look at that, it's beautiful. Especially if you've been walking in Oxford already, you've walked a lot, uh, so you're tired. So yeah, I'm just gonna enjoy the beauty. But uh, he was walking with someone and they just were amazed at how quick his pace was. Lewis would walk at about this pace, all right? He did not waste time. And so that's what you need to picture as him and Dyson and Tolkien are having uh, this conversation. So Maudlin College is one of the loveliest colleges in Oxford. That's true. Uh, situated just outside the old city walls on the banks of the Shoral River, it has some of the most hauntingly beautiful buildings of Oxford. To the north is the Deer Park, which houses the college's 300-year-old deer herd. And to the east is a great meadow around which Addison's Walk uh, runs, just under a mile in length. It is now the evening of September 19th, 1931, and an Ulsterman called C.S. Lewis, a fellow and tutor at Maudlin College, has just had some guests to dinner at the college, and they, they are strolling around Addison's Walk talking about myths. Remember what strolling is. Lewis loved to walk and once commented that having no car, he measured distances by the standard of man walking on his two feet. One of his guests, Professor J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, is the Rolison and Borsworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon and shares with Lewis a deep love of mythology, particularly the mythology of Scandinavia. C.S. Lewis, along, uh, along an atheist, had a recent, of recent times discovered that he was being searched by God. He had stated, a young atheist cannot guard his faith too carefully and admitted that he had no more been searching for God than a mouse would search for a cat. Yet, in the Trinity term of 1929, he wrote, That which I had greatly feared had at last come upon me. I gave in, and admitted that God was God, and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. But who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance to escape? The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. Lewis now believed in God. He was a theist. That is, he believed in the creation of the universe by one God, but he was not yet a Christian. As they walked together, Tolkien maintained that myths preserved something of God's truth, although often in a distorted form. Lewis could not see the relevance of concepts in Christian truth similar to those found in pagan mythologies. For instance, the ideas of sacrifice, the shedding of blood, communion, and redemption. Tolkien maintained that the difference between the Christian story and other stories was that it came from a God who was real and from a God whose dying could transform those who believed in him. A gust of wind came through the trees and leaves fell on Lewis's shoulder. Picture that for a second. And, and you could picture it here really well. Have any of you gone to see the colors? You know, you go to a pass, you stand outside. Uh, it's aspens, right? They have the circular trees. And when the wind's blowing and they're the different yellow, red, green, like that mix, and you just see them like, it, it looks like confetti, like someone just shot a cannon. Like, it, it totally looks like that up in there. They have those kind of trees. Not necessarily, they have a lot of uh, chestnut trees and stuff in there. But that type of effect, if you stand in there and the wind starts blowing, which, follow my brain, the wind, ruach, in the Bible, we translate wind, spirit, breath, all the same. So the wind is stirring. A gust of wind came through. Or, if we're going with biblical translations, a gust of spirit a gust of breath came through. The trees and leaves fell on Lewis's shoulder, but more than leaves fell on that evening. As the two future literary giants and Dyson, he was there, okay? It's not just Tolkien, okay? Dyson's, Dyson's awesome. Uh, talked to three o'clock in the morning and actually was Dyson who stayed with him the latest 
and, and continue the, Tolkien had to get back to his family. Dyson was there for the next few hours, continuing with Lewis in this conversation. Tolkien went home and Hugo Dyson, another friend and academic, continued to talk with Lewis, now striding up and down the arcades of new buildings. That's, that's that building I showed you. He emphasized that the one who believes in Christ receives peace and forgiveness of sins. Three days later, while sitting in the sidecar of his brother's motorcycle en route to Whipsnade Zoo, C.S. Lewis was converted to Jesus Christ. Some of us speculate because of his brother's driving. When we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he wrote in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. And when we reached the zoo, I did. How did Lewis describe his conversion to Christ? He wrote, It was more like when a man, still lying motionless in bed, becomes aware that he is now awake. You're laying in the kingdom of man and God just suddenly gets a hold of you. His kingdom shows up, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And you're lying there unassumingly continuing on with your life, however it's going. And you suddenly realize there's more than just this kingdom here. Lewis entered into a hotspot where the kingdoms again were united. And his life was changed. And because of him, if you were inspired by his life, inspired by his works, our lives have changed. Mostly Americans. Brits don't really like him still, especially academic ones. But he's starting to pick up some popularity. <sighs> there is more that I had planned that I wanted to take you through. Um, but let's at least continue to the end of this path into the fellow's garden, past some trees, we end up at this kind of little, little pond looking thing. I don't know about you, but it kind of reminds me of maybe the wood between the worlds, if you're familiar with that. And almost like if we were to, I don't know, go into this pond, maybe we could go somewhere. We're back here. By the way, there's lunch in the lobby after service today, so uh, I invite you to uh, enter into the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of man together later after the service. Uh, but real quick, I just, I think of the sanctuary and, and I think of Jesus came and he brought the kingdom. We have the scripture that he quotes, uh, I mean, he he. He's reading scripture, I'm sorry. Uh, in, uh, he's reading scripture, the scroll of Isaiah. Uh, he's reading the scripture uh, about how the spirit of the Lord is upon him and that he's been anointed to bring good news to the poor. He's been sent to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see and that the oppressed will go free and that the kingdom of, the, that the day of the Lord has come. And he hands the scroll back to the attendant and he sits down and all eyes are looking at him. Like you just, the guy who's claiming to be the Messiah just read the scroll of Isaiah and he sits down and we're like, okay, what's, what else is he going to say? And he says, the scripture you have heard has been fulfilled this very day. The kingdom is now. And, and the thing that that I've been having to break from is this idea of thinking too much future-wise. It's both and. And when we see the, the chronology that, um, that Peter uses a lot, where it's the numbers and there's seven, 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 like seven is, like the chronology, like the kingdom is now. Jesus brought the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Those are the same in scripture. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus brought that in, and for those of us who trust him and have faith in him, we get to participate in that. And as we participate in it, we become, and this is why I like the hotspot term, especially for our day and age, Jesus is the Wi-Fi. He, and, and we are the little repeaters. We are the little hotspots of uh, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And so if you picture it where man's kingdom is here 
and God's kingdom is here, and then Jesus enters into man's kingdom. You got this little bit here, and then those of us who believe, when we go around in the kingdom of man, we bring the kingdom of heaven wherever we're at. And so then I think, well, what, what do we represent? Who are we as a, a part of the kingdom of heaven as the sanctuary? Uh, because I need to be reminded of this. So I, don't think of it as me telling you, again, this is not required to come here. You don't have to believe this to uh, be a part of the sanctuary. But we as the staff think it's really important. And, and I need to be reminded of as the kingdom of God, as hopefully a potential hotspot for the kingdom of heaven, for the people in this room, outside of this room, this is what we believe. That God is one. That's in scripture. There's no real argument with that. The Lord our God is the Lord alone. He is one. And so his judgment is love because God is love. And he judges. And he judges and his judgment is love. And we take that, okay, God is love and so desires to save. Again, very scriptural. God desire, he does not want any to perish. He desires for everyone to know him. God is almighty. The fun $5 word is, right, omnipotent, omniscient, or $5 words, I should say, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. He's almighty. He's in control. He's sovereign over everything. And so he can save. We don't limit God. We don't like, well, we do limit God. We limit him with what we think can happen and what cannot happen. But God is almighty, and so he can save. And God is Jesus, Yehoshua, God is, the Father is salvation and so does save. His judgment is love. He desires to save. He can save and he does save. Those are the things that we believe. And whenever I think, well, okay, am I really a part of this? Am I really like, is this true? Does that really work? And I start to question, I start to doubt, I start to put this infinite God who is beyond all understanding, his ways are higher than mine, his reasoning's better than mine, uh, and I try to reason, and I try to understand, and I get little bits, and because I get this one little bit, I think then I know everything. Like, that was my favorite, is like, we're gonna listen to people who claim to be experts on these subjects just because they're an expert in a different subject. Like, just because I'm an expert in one thing, like taking you around Oxford, doesn't necessarily mean I'm an expert in microbiology. You know, that's an easy one, okay? Now, I deal with people who uh, are experts in one area of medicine and then claim to be experts in other areas of medicine. It's like, yeah, those people go to school for a lot longer as well uh, for that specific area. So this idea of like, okay, I've got this one little bit and now I'm going to put it on you. I know for certain what God is like and who he is completely because I understand this one little bit. All right. And then when I realize, all right, other people are doing that to me and I don't like that so much. Uh, maybe I need a little check here. Maybe then I start doubting myself. And then I start doubting the Father's words about who I am and who he is. And then I have to remember a couple other things that at least I know Brett said, so I, I know he believes in. And, and I do too. And it's that God is always better than you thought. He is always better than you thought. If you can think of how good something can be, God can think of it better. Like, you're limited, he's not. You're good. He's better, okay? God is always better than you thought. The love of Jesus is deeper than you know. I pray that you might, together with all the saints, understand how deep and wide and long and high is the love of Jesus. I pray that because we will never fully understand the extent of how deep Jesus' love is we will never fully understand. And so when we think, man, Jesus loves this much, man. He loves this much. That's, your arms can't go any farther, all right? And your imagination can only go so far. So remember, the love of Jesus is deeper than you know. It can help you love the person that you hate the most, that annoys you the most. And that might be yourself, if you're like me at times. 
and the spirit is everywhere working the wonders of mercy. That might be the harder one for you to, like we can intellectually acknowledge the other two easy enough. Believing them's hard. This one might be the hardest to really believe because you look around and you're like, well, I see how I act and I definitely see how other people act. Is the spirit really working wonders of mercy? And then you realize, well, for how I am, and God is still tweaking me little by little every day, okay, <laughs> yeah, it, it is a wonder of mercy that I am waking up hopefully a little better than I was yesterday. And if I don't, there's always hope for tomorrow. And so that is who I think we are as the sanctuary and who we should be to each other and encouraging each other, like those things of what we believe and, and the thoughts of who God is, how we should live, especially with each other and especially in our lives. Go be a hotspot for the kingdom of heaven wherever you go. Be connected with the Lord. Be connected with the kingdom itself. Have that good reception with the Spirit and with the Son and with the Father. And wherever you go, then you'll project, you'll have good range, you, four bars of, of hot spot, kingdom of heaven, uh, that other people can connect to and experience the wonders of mercy, the, the love of Jesus, uh, the goodness of God. And when things get difficult, just remember that for yourself. Uh, and if you need help remembering, again, we have a very good opportunity after service uh, for you to go ahead and practice, at least with each other. We should hopefully be a little more forgiving than maybe the world would be when we screw up. Um, and then, yeah, take it outside of these walls, into the neighborhood, into your town, wherever you're at, and, and bring God's kingdom and man's kingdom back together again. Uh, that way Jesus doesn't have really that much to do when he comes back. You know, I, th I think it's kind of like, well, God will fix it all in the end. And it's like, you know, why, I mean, why do we want to make him do more work? Why, why, and more importantly, why don't we want to experience the kingdom of heaven now? I think maybe, because there's a lot of people who are living in hell, and you may be one of them. I know at times I am, and, and I just want to experience heaven now while still enjoying the creation that God has put us into and the relationships and the community here. Uh, and so I invite you to do the same. Um, and one of the ways that we do that, again, uh, engaging with each other is such an important sacrament. And according to Lewis, second to this one. And so on the night that he was betrayed by the people that he hung out with and spent a bunch of time with, and invested in, um, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. So weird. Eat my body. Consume me. Be a full part of me. Take in the kingdom into yourself. And then he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave thanks for it. He said, this is my blood which is poured out for you. It's a new covenant. It's for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And whenever you do these things, do them in remembrance of me. And you know what? Again, we don't understand everything. It could be just a symbol. People who see the beauty in this and take it as more than that, it doesn't really matter. They're taken in Christ. They're taken in the kingdom and they're wanting to be a part of it. And so I invite you uh, to come up and do the same. Eat his, uh, eat his body, drink his blood, and participate in the kingdom uh, together as we continue to worship. So I encourage you, Believe the gospel. The gospel is good news, and the good news is that the king is reigning, and the king is here. Uh, and yeah, I invite you uh, to...
Ted, you're going to come up and pray, yeah? Okay, so if you want prayer, come up and join. Uh, we're going to do one last song, um, if you also want to stay for that. Sasha, if you don't mind, if we do the slides for the last song as our postlude or whatever. Um, and then there's lunch afterwards down in the foyer. Uh, we get to practice engaging with one another, um, eating food together. Jesus did that a lot. So I think that's something, yeah, we could emulate is uh, eating, sitting with one another, sharing stories, sharing our lives, loving each other well. And that's part of God's kingdom. And let's, let's be hotspots for that here. In Jesus' name.